gathered pages to Amulus, the Familiar, Chapter One, Preface and Introduction. Famulus is the result of many years teaching in private circles, as it became vogue to hire tutors around the year 1785. Powerful members of the community gained a certain prominence, not insignificant profits, and found themselves wrestling with a great deal of frustration. This frustration stemmed from the fact that one tutor would teach one thing, which the next tutor would have to correct or account for. They exchanged correspondence to find out what had been taught and why, and opened discussions on how things might be done better. No subject had quite held much importance or drove more heated discussions than the familiar ritual. A lifelong bond between a human and a spirit, a connection forged between them and fed with power to be made permanent. The word familiar comes from the Latin famulus, meaning servant. It came to refer to household and family and over time transitioning to the French familiar. It came to mean intimate or on a family footing. In all of these meanings, description, ritual, and word are linked. The familiar becomes family, the bond is intimate, and there is an implication of servitude. Even after 200 years of discussion and refining of this material, several ideologies and approaches stand out. These details are discussed in separate chapters. Each chapter that follows is preceded by a set of case studies. In chapter two, we discuss the familiar itself, what it is, the limitations, the diversity and approaches which will be expanded on in subsequent chapters. In chapter three, we discuss the bond, the key points, early approaches, modern approaches, universal constants in the human-other relationship, and the shape of the relationship before and after the ritual is enacted. In Chapter 4, we look at the social contexts and environment, differences and familiars by region, micro-social factors, macro-social factors, and cultural factors, both the practitioner-familiar relationship to the outside world and the outside world's relationship to the practitioner-familiar relationship will be discussed. In Chapter 5, we look at the familiars themselves, corporeal and non-corporeal beings, beings from a delineated subtype with a pedigree or subculture, subculture and others who are unique and stand alone. Case study for Chapter 2 Annabelle and Tromos, Steed of Enyo. The penthouse apartment is dark and quiet. The rain traces streams down the windows, and despite the gloom, neither occupant has made an effort to turn on the lights or ignite one of the lanterns that seem so prevalent in the space. There are no walls in the apartment, and everything from the bed to the kitchen is visible, decorated in a clear, distinctive style. In other homes, there are signs of things that don't fit, gifts that were received which do not match the owner's style, or things that were bought because they were inexpensive. Annabelle has made no such concessions, and everything in the space matches, with a motif of wrought iron crisp linen, and very solid oak fixtures for the furniture. Chains are visible hanging from the bed frame, and there are various instruments of war mounted on racks on walls. Both typical spears and swords, shields and the less typical meteor hammer. Eastern weapons and a wicked man-catcher that sits just above the chair she has chosen to sit in for our interview. Viewed under the sight, every one of these objects vibrate with power. 
Annabelle herself is stately and elegant, wearing a simple black dress that wouldn't be out of place in a business setting. Her hair styled upward, but her feet are bare. As she sits in her chair, Tromo slides under her feet, his head just under one of Annabelle's bare feet, which moves periodically to stroke him. The familiar wears the guise of a great bat, black battle-scarred Tibetan mastiff, with three different spiked collars wringing its neck. Interviewer M. Saville, S. The tape recorder is on. Good evening. Thank you for agreeing to this. Annabelle, A. Your offering was adequate. Note, the interviewer bought a McAllen 1949 single, single Highland malt as payment for the hospitality and interview. Yes. I'm glad. Shall we start with the basics? Who are you? Do you have any focus on to your craft? A. I'm lord of this city. Conventional wisdom calls me a Valkyrie. A shaman imbuing objects with power and incorporeal others? Yes. And Tromos, Steed of Enyo? I know who and what you are, but I'd like to have it on the record for the benefit of our readers. Tromos, Steed of Enyo, T. You may call me Tromos. We can do without the title to hurry this along. I was the steed of a goddess of war and ruin. The gods I served, fought beside and fought against, have grown weaker in recent years. While my gods withered and grew small, their worshippers few, I turned to creating dreams of utter terror, and I have survived the centuries. Conventional wisdom would call my Tromos a nightmare. How did you meet? An enemy of mine sent him against me to deny me sleep and weaken my position before negotiations. It worked. An unfamiliar battlefield, a powerful foe. Terror dreams so bad that they gave me nightmares for weeks after the fact. My enemy took the upper hand. They decided to use Tromos again. I suspect to weaken my position because I was a contender at the time for Lord of the City. And? It worked the second time, but I held my seat. On the third time, you do know the rule of three, don't you? Third time's a charm, so to speak. There's a bit more power in it. That third victory matters more than the first two put together. In some areas, it has power because we give it power. My opponent gave it power, then. On the third attempt, I beat Tromos, and there was an advantage in that, more than I might have had if I had won on the first or second time. I turned Tromos against the one who set him on me, then I turned him on the co-conspirators, and I directed him to a handful of the people who tried to take advantage of my diminished faculties. We came to like each other. She has something of the poise of the gods I used to serve. She was ruthless in dealing with her enemies, which is good. When she showed me that she could become lord by her own merit, I accepted the deal. Can I ask what the balance of power is between you? I take power from Tromos. He shores my weaknesses, as I am focused on physical applications. Objects I can hold, his power lies in emotion, in dreams, and he is a divine being. 
When I need strength against something I can't chain down or impale with a spear, I borrow power from my familiar. He herds the spirits so I might bind them into objects. Through my connection to him, everything I do and touch conveys a trace of fear to others. What does Tromos get out of the bargain? Were I to ask you if you could take four years without having to eat, if you did not feel like it, four years where you did not suffer any if you did not sleep, that is what this is to me. I am anchored in this weird world. So long as I am bound to her, I will not degrade, I will not hunger. Any power I take can make me stronger, and so long as she does not fritter it away, which she will not, I will be in a better place than I was before. What happens after? Annabelle isn't immortal, I presume. We've talked about that. I enjoy her company. If she is strong enough, she will join me in the dreams. When I visit nightmares unto others, I ride them down. The great black wolf, the bull, the horse, the brutish man. They flee, tripping and injuring themselves, climbing to their feet only to trip again until they are too battered to stand. Or they run out of strength and hear my footfalls as they lie there, panting, and then they feel the injuries. They feel pain, and they know terror. I could see Annabelle there, a rider astride me, a taunting voice, someone to trip them up one final time, to bar their way. When we were not riding down our prey, we might roam, visit realms, domains, and dimenses freely open to others. It sounds like a fun way to spend a few decades or centuries. She would be subordinate to you then, Dromos? the passenger you carry with you through the world of dreams. As much as Tromos is subordinate to me now, by which I mean not at all, not in practice. I would not have it. Regrets? Things you didn't expect. You learn a great deal about humans being mortal spending so much time around them. I've grown better at what I do, knowing the physical responses, what it feels like to have a heart thudding in the chests. It opened up a whole new world for me. Dream, fear, a bit of the divine. I've taken a more old-school path, Valkyrie-wise, with a bit of worship in there. No regrets, then? None worth speaking of. I mean, I probably won't ever marry or have friends. Anyone who interacts with me too much has bad dreams. But I'm at peace with that. Anything else to add? We're wrapping up already. No. Nothing else. Implementum, Chapter 5, Symbol of Office. This chapter, like previous chapters, has a dual purpose. The first is on a new subject, 
the effects on personal presentation and the status afforded by one's implement. Second, by examining the role of the implement on a symbolic social level, we can review the major elements of the implement covered already in this text and view these things in another light. When addressing the relationship between the implement and the context we find it in, we aren't interested in the implement that just so happens to be found in a particular context. Rather, we are concerned with how implements of a particular type form trends and patterns as they find their ways to certain types of individual and the status and ideas they present to others. To these ends, we will be using some of the 21 example implements we used in previous chapters to illustrate. The stone is, of course, not an implement anyone would choose. It is empty, base, simple and unrefined. However, as in previous chapters, the stone can serve to introduce and illustrate ideas. Fitting, perhaps, given the stone's already stated nature as the zero of implements. What is the stone's relation to others? There are three dimensions we can study. The declarative. What does the stone convey to others in terms of what it is and what it says about you? In every case, every obvious aspect about the object itself will say something about the wielder. If the stone is rough, it may convey the wielder is rough. An ornate object might convey the wielder has a certain prestige. When you read the second chapter and imagine the type of individual who might wield the stone as an implement, did you think of a caveman or thug? Someone earthy? Someone crude? Someone stupid? Certainly possible if the stone is so heavy it cannot be readily carried, and the practitioner still chose it. This is the implement's declarative aspect. From the manner that the object must be transported or carried, displayed or hidden, we can determine certain things about a practitioner. The authoritative. What does the stone convey to others when it is used? In Chapter 3, we discuss the effect of the implement on the practice. This is a related element, but our concern is on others, and others will find the stone and any workings utilizing the stone to be blunt, direct, unrefined, and hard to ignore once it comes to bear. Social cultural. What groups use this implement? Why? What is their focus? From here, we draw statistics from communities around the world where implements are used. We don't have hard data on who might have used the stone as an implement or where, as it isn't in common or uncommon use. The remainder of the implements, declarative, authoritative, and socio-cultural. The wand, declarative. The wand is not in common use in the world, barring stage shows. However, it is easily hidden, indicating a balance between the two worlds. It can easily be decorated or high quality and is distinctly a practitioner's and the practice. As such, the wielder can be assumed to be focused on practitioners and their workings. The result might be an ease with altering or adjusting the work of others. Defense against workings, and especially offense against workings. See the notes on the authoritative below. Authoritative. The wand is short and readily hidden. It is adroit, easily flourished, stylish, and not without some small versatility. It lends itself to creativity and movement, but is phallic and direct in demeanor implying conviction and a more aggressive nature when brandished in seriousness. Socio-cultural. The wand is predominantly used in London, with a surveyed 63% of practitioners carrying wands there. In the practitioner schools in the United Kingdom, wands are provided to the students by default, 
for their convenience, easy portability, and a prevailing sentiment that the wand is the strongest implement of choice for practitioner dealings against hostile practitioners. The Talisman Declarative The talisman indicates an idea or object of importance to the wearer. It can be readily worn in plain sight, but indicates a manner of symbolism and power that isn't evident at first sight. The wearer might be assumed to be more intuitive than direct, more wise or focused than the abstract, than brash or real. The nature of the talisman, once it is recognized as an implement, might indicate a great deal about the wearer, leading to fast conclusions. Authoritative. The talisman is subtle and readily hidden, but unlike the wand or knife, it isn't inherently threatening. The emphasis might be on symbols and depictions, secrets and bindings, but not necessarily traps, as well as elements of larger fixtures. As something worn, it tends to relate to the practitioner and their being, and to the practitioner and things they can touch, or touch the talisman to. Sociocultural Talismans used to be worn by sects in what would have become Ireland but they have fallen out of favor given their naturally passive nature. It is interesting to note that the recurring rise and fall of talismans as implements in sisterhoods, with some appearing in small covens, even in modern times. The Scepter Declarative. The scepter is bold, brilliant, almost always dramatic in appearance and is impossible to ignore. It is not readily hidden and with its natural link to presence, station and organization, suggests a kind of personal power and aspiration on the part of the wielder. Despite the phallic shape, the scepter is rarely pointed, but is instead held, prominent and visible. Authoritative. The focus of the scepter is not necessarily on striking, nor does it flourish so well as the wand. The scepter is focused instead on presentation. The wielder of a classic scepter might be more focused on the manner of things, not alteration, but on granting and lending effects to things. As the king wields a scepter to represent the royal family, the scepter's wielders reach may also extend to their organization or family. Sociocultural. Few organizations make use of scepters en masse. Instead, the scepter is chosen in isolated cases as a statement, a subtle challenge that indicates a desire for power or station in some form, or one's representation of their family. The largest group that might be said to make regular use of the scepter would be the Anglo-influenced Japanese families of practitioners who have taken on the Western traditions of choosing implement, familiar, and demences for their personal power. The proposed head of a household of practitioners bears a symbol of office that resembles the scepter in execution, though it is typically a blade that never leaves its sheath. The sword. Declarative. Few implements are so obvious as the sword in their declarative purpose. Phallic in every respect, direct, obvious, impossible to hide. It is a declaration of war while drawn and implies a readiness for battle while kept on one's person. 
authoritative. The sword is used to attack above all else, and can puncture all but the strongest defences, and it lends the same to the workings it pra its practitioner uses. Better at deflecting than defending, the sword remains predominantly concerned with war and offensive and defensive uses. Sociocultural in the United States and England, the sword as an implement has an unfortunate tendency to come about when young men decide what their implement will be. At this time in their lives, their hormones are at the highest point and their maleness is most pronounced. Nearly 9% of male practitioners under the age of 18 pick the sword, only to find it serves less of a purpose as they reach adulthood. Some have suggested that this is linked to the same trend where youths are introduced to the practice and largely abandon it in later life. The chalice. Declarative. The chalice is a hard item to carry about day to day, though it can be kept in a purse or bag. At the same time, it is not explicitly out of place in the world. More often, however, the chalice is ornamental, found in a home or on a table or desk rather than outside that home or room. The chalice is explicitly female in shape. Note the profile of the chalice itself, and the link to water and wine, and the passive, receptive nature of the piece. The chalice is not the province of woman alone, any more than the sword belongs to men alone, but a man wielding a chalice might be viewed in a light very similar to a woman holding a sword, especially by the more traditional. As a drink is rarely taken alone, the chalice might be declare something on a social level. Authoritative. The chalice is a container, and as such can be used to hoard a measure of power, but unlike the box, it does not contain or store it long term. Many will use the chalice to hold blood from a sacrificed individual or being, and as such it becomes a battery for power. As the chalice holds liquid, the implement allows the wielder to hold or sustain effects using the aforementioned battery. Sociocultural. The use of the chalice wanes in almost perfect accordance with the rise of woman's rights and female independence. Once a traditional and even expected implement for woman practitioners, the chalice is being replaced by things more personal dropping from a 59% usage in Europe to an 11% usage at the time of this text's publication. Exercises for the novice. Take time to consider how the other 15 iconic implements might be viewed and exercised in a declarative, authoritative, or socio-cultural light. Tome, ring, chakram. Plate, staff, coin, emblem, chain, skull, knife, standard, lens, mask, lantern, trumpet, and coffer. Dementors. Chapter 9. First Step in One's Place of Power. In Chapter 9, we introduce a new example. Fiona is one of the Dryder, a priestess, alone. She has blood, family, and the woman as her personal totems. A drinking vessel crafted of her brother's freely given skull as her implement and no familiar. 
She brought the building her apartment is in, made her claim, fought for the property, and won it. After weeks of effort and days of challenges, she has a place of power. For so many practitioners, the question is simple. Now what? It is easy to be caught up in the hectic and thought-consuming task of staking one's claim. Making the claim and dealing with the challenges. In Fiona's case, she incurred several debts, but lost nothing of substance in negotiating matters when the challenge was lost. In the quiet that follows the storm, it is easy to make the simple, damning mistake of thinking one must maintain that pace. Practitioners must remember that once the final challenge is passed, they have a lifetime to enjoy the fruits of their labor. Fiona forces herself to step away from the demence for a time to better ensure her perspective is fresh and unsullied by recent events. She sees to the small debts she can in the practitioner community, works at her day job as a nurse in a obstetrics, and takes the time to meet with friends she has neglected while seeing to her side project. Remember that the demence is a reflection and an extension of the self. The practitioner should remind themselves of who they are and reacquaint themselves with forgotten interests, hobbies, connections, and matters of taste and style. When Fiona does return to her place of power, she finds herself disappointed. There is little doubt this is her place of power, but the effect is minor at best. The spirits and entities that have not been driven away by the challenge are few in number, and she finds herself less powerful in her domain than she is elsewhere. After the monumental investment in time and effort, and the debts incurred, initial reactions can be devastating. This in itself can be damaging because one's mood and ideas can influence the demence, and the demence at this point in time is in a fledgling state. Fiona is more or less at ease, thanks in part to the large time she took to herself. She focuses on the details. She sees how the very air in her demence cooperates. It tastes cleaner and does not bar her movement, but buoys her. The ground accommodates her football falls. She tries to manipulate the environment by combinations of touch, word, and will, and finds it easy. The aesthetics are the easiest part of it to change, and she takes her time altering her surroundings. Fiona makes wall and floor into flesh, the place of power becoming a womb of sorts. All things in her place of power are moist, and the ticking of a clock becomes the dull, distant thud of a heart. Veins on every surface throb in time with the sound. There are no wrong answers with how one customizes their place of power, but one should keep in mind that they may want to invite another into the area and make the necessary arrangements. The area is very easy to influence, and this can prove problematic if one has other power sources in play. The biggest and most obvious issue is when the familiar enters the picture. As an extension of the practitioner, they have a claim to some of the place of power. If the practitioner and familiar are in accord, the issue is a minor one. If they are not, it can be a source of friction that compromises the demence. In any event, the familiar's nature, background, mentality, and power will affect the demence. In other cases, the practitioner may be drawing personal power from another source. To use a metaphor, this may add a dollop of color to the paintbrush, leaving streaks on the demence as the practitioner paints. If they draw power from death and decay, they might find these elements alter the surroundings. A typical solution is to focus this power. 
If the familiar cannot be reconciled with, the practitioner can focus this other power into an area. The familiar can be given a dedicated space so that their power does not bleed throughout the remainder of the demence. These hypothetical powers of death and decay could be focused into a single ornament or object decorating the area. The droid briefly laments the mess caused by the blood in her demence. Pools of sanguine humour and warm trickles from the roof. As she cleans, she discovers that she can remove the mess while retaining the blood. A small contradiction, but possible nonetheless. With testing, she finds she can alter the other rules of her surroundings. Even a small demence can be larger inside than it was on the outside. Laws of gravity, physics, rules of magic, and more can be bent or broken entirely. Any rule can theoretically be broken within the demence. Should every rule be broken? No. Everything in moderation. Stories abound of practitioners who never left their demences a place that is entirely theirs where they are a step below a god, and a place where they are safe. The issue arises when the practitioner loses their connection to the outside world, with nothing tying them to people or things they stagnate, growing weaker, and as they grow weaker so does the place of power. The effect is a cyclical one prompting some desperate practitioners to devote more time and attention to rescuing their domain, failing to see the problem at the root of the issue. In other cases, the practitioner is so attached to their demence that they become a part of it. When it fades from the world, so do they. When the practitioner's demence coincides with that of their place of power, the end result is typically a ghost and or a location saturated with power. When Fiona leaves her domain, she finds more time than expected has passed. This is a typical thing. Intentionally or instinctively, a practitioner often manipulates time within their realm. When they leave, however, time hurries to catch up with them. The end result is often not intuitive and can lead to some confusion. Adapting to this eventuality is a part of learning to use one's place of power. Whilst outside of her place of power, Fiona finds the connection to the location remains strong wherever she is. She can deposit power there and rest assured it is untouched. She can also use the location to transmute power, turning personal power into karmic assets, draw from one kind of power to better influence a connection. As one can determine the rules within their realm, they can use the place as a form of esoteric money changer, changing one kind of power for another. Some find they can draw on their continual connection to their place of power to access it from remote locations. This typically requires a fair amount of power and may be rooted in certain rules or restrictions. One might use a key in an appropriate lock to access the demence, for example. Others might draw a door in chalk or step through a pool of blood left around a slain enemy. As she's made her place her own, Fiona finds that she can use power more readily in the area. She notes, in a matter-of-fact way, that simply holding a demence generates good karma, bettering her position, in, her position in the world so long as she tends to the space. The problem, however, remains. She isn't stronger there than she is in the outside world. 
Having driven away the spirits in the course of the challenge, our example case finds that the spirits and beings that remain are conciliatory. How, then, does the practitioner build up a power base? Fiona finds that as she draws and manipulates power in and around the domains, its power extends into the real world and vice versa. Spirits in alignment with her draw like spirits with them. And on a more complicated level, intelligent beings who visit her domains and find it to their liking may contact others. Word of mouth spreads, for lack of a better term. Herein lies the heart of the Dement's dilemma. The greater the claim, the greater the power that is reaped. But an area where there are no beings to challenge the practitioner will have few beings of any import occupying or neighboring it, almost strictly by definition. It proves useless to the practitioner. Worse, it is stagnant, refusing to grow, for one needs power to gain power and such spaces have no inherent power to start with. It is a canvas to be painted, but nothing more. She settles into her new role as ruler of this demence. As she forms contracts with others, the demence becomes a meeting place, and even a home to some beings who give their tribute in turn, by way of power, gifts, or service. A subject that leads us into our next chapter on the rules and dealings of others within the Dements. Famulus the Familiar Case study for Chapter 2, Lacey and Vic. Vic is clearly nervous. He fidgets and, in the minute before the interview begins, downs a beer, gets up to get another, and nearly downs the second. His clothes have stains that indicate they haven't been washed in some time, and his beard growth and the state of his hair suggest the same. His hygiene and condition accepted, the only remarkable trait about him is his height. Lacey, by contrast, is motionless, staring at the interviewer. She wears only a sleeveless t-shirt and underwear as she sits beside Vic on the couch. Her hand never leaves her weapon, an engraved gun. The house is very similar to the couple that own it. As they haven't taken much care of themselves, they've let the house languor. The front yard is overgrown. Mess litters every surface inside, and bottles are predominant in the clutter. There are children's toys, but no sound or sign of a child in the house. Interviewer, you, Roik, are... You're sure this is all right? You don't look very at ease. Lacey, L. We're never at ease. You have that? Yes, I'll give it to you when the interview is done. Fine, then let's get started. You're the practitioner. Vic is the familiar? That's right. We decided the interview questions in advance so we could compare and contrast for the book. If we deviate, it's only going to be a little. Can I ask, who are you? What's your background? I'm... I don't know. A girl. A woman, I guess. Even if I don't feel like a grown-up, I'm... and I'm almost thirty. Grew up in the next town over. Went to school, had friends. 
I guess the only thing that set me apart was that my mom and dad knew some of this magic stuff. They taught me it, told me they wanted me to gain an edge. Did you? Yes, popular, did okay in my classes, cheated every step of the way using the tricks I'd been taught, but yeah. If someone made a problem for me, I'd put them down hard, ended up on top of the heap, dated the captain of the local basketball team. No, Lacey pauses to indicate Vic beside her. And you, Vic? Who are you? Vic V. I was on top of the heap, like Lacey. But I didn't cheat to get there. Natural talent and hard work. Met Lacey, she introduced me to this stuff. You're getting ahead of me, can I confirm? You're human? Am I? I was. You were human when you met Lacey? Yes. All right. You were telling me how you two met? She was there at a party. I said hi. She said hi back. Longest we've been apart since is when we slept. Phone calls, meetings before school, meetings between classes, meeting after school, parties. She was there for the games. You were successful? Yes. I mean, not like I was going to be on the top school in the country on a sports scholarship, but it was a damn good chance the college was going to invite me to play for them, you know? You use the past tense. It's an old story, isn't it? Stupid kid starts using performance enhancers, it only goes bad. Side effects take over. Except they weren't drugs, or steroids, or any of that. Unless he had another way. War paint, a few words. Some of the other guys on the team got into it. My mom always called it writing. Possession. Controlled possession. The spirit of something fierce to make him move a little faster, make him a little stronger. Give him that edge he needs to spook the other guys for a second when he looks them in the eye. Surface deep stuff. Stuff that can be explained away by a placebo effect and some cosmetic stuff with the team. What happened? It went wrong? We're not sure what happened. The stars aligned wrong, or it was a full moon, or whatever it was. Got a foothold somewhere along the way. Put on the war paint, and I wasn't me anymore. I came to, and I was violently ill, soaked in blood. Someone else's. Adam Chell. Kid we'd picked on in school. While I was out of it, I'd gone after him. Ate my fill of him. Threw up. Ate more. Woke up while throwing up. I slip in and out now. The wind blows the wrong way, and I'm not me. Even when the wind isn't blowing, though, I'm not the me I used to be. I breathe different, react different when I'm stressed. I get sick, barely eat. It's a nature spirit, a predatory one. The hawk, the wolf, the fox, the wild cattle bundled up into one thing. I baited it, I leashed it, and I contained it. There was no way it should have become as strong as it was. No way the boundary between Vic and the spirit should have broken down like it did, but they're one and the same now. I'd note that Vic wears human form. Most deals allow familiars to go back to their regular form. Human form is Vic's regular shape. We modified the deal so there wouldn't be any changing one way or another. The way we figured it, we're trying to get Vic to be less like a spirit and more like a person. Turning him into a mouse or cat or whatever doesn't help things on that end.
Taking a small form helps to conserve power, but I suppose that wasn't a concern. No reason to believe he's slowly losing power? No. Maybe he is, but not like that. No, stuff like his eyes and hair change back and forth day by day, depending on how much of a hold the spirit has. His behavior, too. The bond stabilizes things, anchors it all in place, but the spirit is getting more leverage, creeping in around the edges. Which gives me an excuse to get back on topic. You say it stabilized him. Was that the first reasoning behind forming the bond in the first place? No. We didn't realize it was a problem back then. We did know he was a little more other than he should be, which gave us the idea. Uh, I went to court. I mean, I murdered someone and nobody was backing me up. Lacey went to the local practitioners, but they told her I was shit out of luck. Police said it was drugs, and I couldn't argue, not without saying something that would get me sent to a psychiatric hospital. He got out on bail, which kind of didn't surprise me. Local sports star, you know. We tried to remove the spirit. I'd have succeeded if he hadn't spent the days and night. He did it in the jail in the meantime. Too long, too much chance for the spirit to get its claws in. Came down to it, we decided we needed to resort to other means. Getting ourselves in deeper. The thing with familiars, it's like you got a cord between you and the familiar. A tether or a channel with stuff flowing both ways. And you've locked it in. You always know where the familiar is and they know where you are. It's a hard thing to break. Your familiar won't die like they otherwise might, but they might borrow a chunk from you or to keep themselves going if they want. Part of any connection between things is proximity. Not many situations where a master is going to get separated from their familiar. So we did the bond, sealed it, whole shebang. That bond's a leash tying him to me and vice versa. But if you get a grip on things, that leash isn't going to stretch any. The distance between us is set. No way he was going off to prison if I didn't. We have one unit, right? One unit. Note, at this point, Victor leaves to get another bear. Once we had the bond, the system couldn't get hooks into him. It tried. People pointed fingers at me, but since we weren't going to be going to the same prison, they didn't get much traction. It was a pregnancy scare. I imagine the world was contriving to put me in some shitty hick town just outside the prison. Regular visits. I don't know. Once I fixed that, things settled down. Probation. We moved in together, so that worked, I guess. What is the balance of power between you two? What do you mean? Well, apparently the uh, interviewer is female. My mistake. She wants to know who wears the pants in this relationship. More nuanced than that. Yeah, no, I get it. The thing is, this isn't just us two. You got the spirit in there. Want to know who wears the pants? It's the spirit. It's the spirit that makes Vic restless, so he can't be in a car or a city without feeling like he's in the wrong place. Spirit that made it so he can't touch metal without it hurting him somehow. Knives go out of their way to cut him. Scuffed patches on metal catch at his skin to make him bleed. Cars won't start if he's inside, so... We're here. Middle of fuck all nowhere. Fifteen minute drive to the nearest shitty convenience store where I can buy cigarettes, beer, and bread. In terms of power, do you draw from him? Nah, no, I tried. Tried to siphon as much as I could every way I thought I could. See if I couldn't weaken the spirit so he could beat it. 
like radiation, shrinking a tumour before surgery. It was always clever like that. Yeah. Like radiation. So radiation's bad for you, right? We pushed, the spirit pushed back, and the spirit won in the end. That's when we had to move out of the city. Got a foothold in there, and he's restless all the time now. So I back him up. He takes power from me, because he is losing his self in a way. Capital S. Takes a chunk out of me, but I try to back him up, so he stays Vic and doesn't become something halfway between Vic and the spirit. Oh, the spirit eats me, because that's what predators do. They tear chunks out of their prey and they eat them. I suppose that answers my question. What happens after? It's been a long time, long, long time since I gave any thought to after. No, Victor nods at this. Were there any elements you didn't expect? Regrets? What kind of question is that? The last question before I give you the talisman. Same question we're asking all of the interviewees we're considering for this chapter. Do I have to answer? Will you not give us the talisman if I don't want to respond? I think you've already answered. Thank you for your time. Not like we're going anywhere. No, the talisman intended to help Vic manage his control over his other half was given to the couple and the interview ended there. <laughs>